Um, so um, the run of show tonight is going to be basically in three parts. Um, in about a minute or so, I'm going to slip into character as if I'm speaking to um, a, a, one of the more typical audiences that I, that I talk to, uh, perhaps a Rotary Club or some, some group where, where they're not as experienced on the topic. The first part will be sort of a, a demo, as you sort of um, asked me to do, and I'll, we'll do that. Um, and then we'll go into um, almost an autopsy where I'll dissect the, um, the, the first part and try to show you how some of the things that may have been obvious, but that um, will maybe some of them weren't obvious, how I try to apply the, 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 the um, uh, concepts from uh, the last time we met into building this conversation uh, tonight. So I'll try to show you how to do that. And then the third part uh, will be, I think we'll have plenty of time for a, an open dialogue where we can um, have, a, have a discussion, question and answer. I know um, last time we convened, I learned several useful things from that part. So I'm looking forward to it. So with uh, no further ado, um, I'll go ahead and start. So, hi, I'm Ed Weisbart. Thanks for inviting me. I chair the Missouri chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. And um, I'll bet you're wondering why we're talking about healthcare at a time that the country is in such a, such a crisis. And part of the reason that I think you're interested in it and why you're here tonight is because healthcare has been in crisis for a while and the COVID-19 experience is making us even more aware of some of the problems. And part of why I wanted to talk to you tonight is because I think Medicare can serve as part of the rescue of how we can get out of the problems that we have, some of the problems that we have with, uh, with, with the crisis at hand. So to, to get to that, first I want to tell you a bit about my family, my mother-in-law, and there she is, hi Ma. So um, if you don't think that's the most beautiful mother-in-law in the world, you can leave the room right now and you can log off. Um, I have my mother-in-law's permission to tell you this story. So she lives in Florida. She has a, a rare uh, cardiac condition, a genetic, a rare genetic cardiac condition. And there's no one in Florida that has any experience treating it. But I live in St. Louis and it happens that there are three places in the country that do have experience with that. And one of them is here in St. Louis. So we flew Ma from Florida to St. Louis where she got arguably world-class care uh, and went back home. Uh, and this was seven, I think, years ago, and it, it worked great. She has gotten no bills from that. She can come here without having to ask anybody for permission. Indeed, I managed her care and didn't have to call anybody for authorization of any sort um, because she has Medicare and a supplement. She can go anywhere she wants and didn't have to pay any out-of-pocket expense. She has one of those kinds of supplements and, and did great with it. Um, she now seven years later has yet to receive any surprise bills, not the anesthesia, not anything, no surprises. And, and the key is that it's now, you know, years later, uh, she is now 90 and she trusts that Medicare has been there for what, 25 years and she trusts that it will always be there for her. And if she had to worry about that, if she saw somebody thinking about messing up their Medicare, that's what she would start to look like. She does not want her insurance to be threatened. But we know that it is being threatened for a lot of people. It's not just my mother-in-law. A lot of us uh, have the experience of going to a physician's office and we go to the window and we notice this little sign there, this placard, that we may or may not pay much attention to. It says something like this, we're sorry your doctor's office no longer accepts these insurances. And then there's a list and you look at your card and you look at the list and you go, oh, thank goodness I'm not on that list. And then you usually forget that the sign is there and you move on. So that's a very polite way of making the sign. A perhaps more honest way would be to say, it's not your fault, but this is goodbye. We found other patients whose insurance will pay us more. That's what, that's, that's what that little sign really means. It's not your fault, but this is goodbye. We're gonna no longer accept you as a patient because we have other insurance products that will pay us more than, than yours does. And it's not just, you know, the one-offs, it's, it's every place. You know, the, we, we kind of think that our insurance is reliable, that we can count on it. But what was the first thing that General Motors did when UAW went on strike a few months ago? The very first thing that, that, the general, that their employer did, that General Motors did, was they took away their health insurance. And, and I don't know if you've had many conversations with union folks, but until that sort of thing started happening, most of them perceived their healthcare as a, as a rock solid, reliable piece, part of their life. And 
the strike taught us that even for a for a, for a, a solid, hardworking, aggressive union like UAW, even there, healthcare can disappear in the blink of an eye. So that's just that's just not right. Um, so what's so great about Medicare? Why are we talking about a system built on Medicare? There's three things I would say. The first is it's yours and you're in control of it, as I sort of demonstrated a few minutes over the past couple of minutes. Second thing is Medicare does not waste your money. And thirdly, it makes you live longer and healthier. So I want to unpack those uh, last two points a little bit more. So uh, first, Medicare means we don't have to waste our money. Here's the uh, insurance overhead from, for the larger insurance companies. Uh, on the bottom of the chart there, you'll see a footnote. Uh, and that's going to be a, a footnote will be on all of my slides where uh, there's numbers, as this one will. Uh, it's probably too small for you to read, but if you need the source, we can kind of put our noses up to it and, and read it. But just to show you that the data is, is public, public domain sort of available, uh, creditable sources. This data is, for example, from SEC. So, so the overhead for the insurance companies is, as you may have known, in the 12 to 18 percent, and some are actually considerably higher. Um, the overhead for Medicare, on the other hand, is a remarkable 2.3 percent, and that's that's all in, including the brick and mortar and and everything uh, of, of of the government offices that they operate out of. And it's not magic, right? Um, the insurance companies have high overhead because they have to pay for the ads on TV. They have to hire all the people that say no to the stuff we want. They, they have to pay commissions and profits and sales and marketing and, uh, and large salaries. And Medicare, frankly, doesn't have to do any of that. So Medicare operates with a remarkably small um, overhead. And these numbers, as, as dramatic as they may appear to you, are actually the smaller part of where the waste, where we're wasting our money, is. So we're wasting our money in terms of paying for large overhead for these insurance companies, but even more than this part of the number, we're wasting, they've managed to hide their overhead in medical offices and in hospitals. Doctors spend about $100,000 a year on staff who just manage the insurance companies. That has to come out of the rates, that's what's part of what determines the rates. Um, and hospitals actually have enormous staff. Hosp we have about 900,000 hospital beds in the United States. And we have roughly 900,000 people working in hospitals in billing and insurance related functions. So the average hospital could put somebody full time at the foot of every bed from billing, not from nursing, but from billing. And here's Duke's data actually. Duke, so some hospitals have more and some have fewer um, billing staff. Duke has 957 hospital beds across their system. And publicly reported, they employ a billing staff of 1,600 people. 1,600 billing staff to deal with 1,000 hospital beds. So there's a lot of money being spent in there. And understand, we're the only country that does this. You know, we're the only country that's, that puts our healthcare dollars like this. Toronto General, with about 600 beds, I think it is, has 12 billing staff. So that's money that they're not spending and that they're able to spend on healthcare instead. What's the one reason we have the insurance companies that demand this overhead? It's because they claim that they can keep the cost of healthcare under control. So that's a good thing. We want them to do that. But how well do they perform? Well, here's, here's data from the last eight years about how much people, how much the insurance companies have spent per enrollee since 2008, um, the trend over time. And what turns out is that in the private insurance industry, the cost of healthcare has gone up by nearly 53% over the last 10 years. Is that a lot? Is that a little? Well, it turns out that Medicare has kept that down to less than half of that. So the one thing that we pay the insurance companies to do to control the cost of insurance and to keep us from having to waste money in healthcare, the one thing we want them to do, it turns out Medicare is phenomenally better at that than the insurance companies are. So that's interesting. But, you know, I'm a doctor, so the part that I'm more interested in, frankly, is the health of Americans. And here's, here's some data from the Institute of Medicine that looks at our life expectancy compared to life expectancies elsewhere in the modern world. And you didn't need me to tell you this. You knew this before I came in. American life expectancies are actually three or four years shorter than elsewhere in the world. Our lives are being cut short compared to those elsewhere in the modern world. You knew that before we came in. This particular chart, which I promise you is my wonkiest chart, looks at that data by age. So on the left-hand side, you see babies, then you see kids, then you see uh, younger adults, older adults, and on the right-hand side, you see 90-year-olds, 95-year-olds, and such. 
and it's our ranking against the rest of the world, against 17 uh, peer nations. And no surprise, given what, I already, what you already knew and what I said a moment ago, we come in worst in the modern world. Our lives are being cut short, and we come in worst in the modern world until we turn 65. And then it's amazing, but country by country and year by year, we climb to best in the world. So we have much to be proud of. We, you can't become best in the world unless you happen to have many of the world's best, doctors and hospitals and nurses and pharmacists and all that. We obviously do, or we couldn't possibly accomplish that. The problem to me is pretty obvious. We just don't let everybody in. We put a paywall in the way of healthcare. So, so what are we talking about tonight as a solution to this? We're talking about what's called single payer or Medicare for all. You've probably heard these words, but they, they basically mean two things. First, they say take Medicare and protect it, because you probably know Medicare is under attack, and that would make my mother-in-law very unhappy, and now me, since I have it too. So protect Medicare and make it better. There's some things about it that need to be made better. And then stop leaving people out. Nobody should be left out. So what does protecting it and making it better mean? First, get all the care that we each need. We each need these things. Everybody needs prescription drugs. Everybody needs eyeglasses, dentistry, hearing aids. There's about 15 or 20 of these things that we need that Medicare doesn't cover today and that people buy supplements and things for. We need that. So the first thing when we say Medicare for all is we really mean improving it, making it better. Put in the things that we all need, like prescription drugs and eyeglasses, and then fund it like we fund other public goods. Fund it like we do the fire department. We should no longer have co-pays or deductibles or premiums or have to pay for supplements or any of that stuff. You don't pay those things for the fire department, usually in most, most places. So fund it like we do other important public goods like the fire department and, and just do it through a fair and equitable tax system. Um, and leave nobody out, right? That means include you, include me, include all of my friends, all of your friends, all of our family, all of our neighbors, include Everybody in the town next door, in the town down this, in the town across in the other states, everybody, include everybody in this. And nobody should be left out, including really no doctors or hospitals. Um, I guess in rare cases, maybe you'd find a doctor that would choose not to participate. But basically, you personally would pick the best, who, whatever you think is the best doctor and hospital for you. You would be in control of that. You wouldn't have to check with a crazy network system. You personally choose the doctors and hospitals whom you think are best for you. And Congress should be in the same plan. There's no reason that uh, Congress should have some different plan or that the president or the mayor should have some different plan. Everybody should be in this plan. Nobody should be left out. Now you're probably asking yourself, gee, that sounds just you know, lovely, but how in the world can we afford this? You're probably asking yourself that. And I'm gonna tell you that we're already paying more than we would need to. So here's, uh, here's us compared to all these other countries, and I could put more that would look the same pattern, like the same pattern, and you can see that our public dollars, our tax-funded dollars, that pay for the military and Medicare and Medicaid, the tax write-offs we give to employers for, for paying for insurance, uh, everybody, the, all the public dollars today comes up to almost the most money in the world per person, and we leave tens of millions of Americans uninsured and more um, very fragile. And then if you add in the private insurance, what we pay Blue Cross and Aetna and all of those, we come to more than $11,000 per person, almost double what any other country is, what almost any other country is paying. So we're paying plenty for this. If those other countries can afford to do it, we can afford to do something like this, like this too. And it's not just my word, it turns out that there have been dozens of studies from economists all over the country that said that the savings that we would get from this would at least fund the expansion in coverage. Actually, 253 economists uh, recently came out and said, the time is now for Medicare for All. So of course we can afford uh, to do this. Um, what do we learn from COVID? Now we learned a few important things. The first is that the American people really can rely on Medicare. Uh, and we need to, right? We each need our health care. If you're white, black, brown, any person who needs health care should be able to get health care. We've discovered this. It's so, it's so clear from people who get sick uh, and, and are potentially infectious. We all, we each need our health care and we each, we each need each other to have their health care. We each need our hospitals. 
um, we're, we're actually, because of the pandemic, we're actually furloughing and sometimes firing physicians and nurses and closing some hospitals during a pandemic, <laughs> during a pandemic. In other countries that are pandemic stricken, much like we are, um, they're able to redeploy their nurses and doctors into the areas that, that really need them so that they're able to balance their resources. We have no capacity to do that. It would, it, we just can't do that. And we, we, need, we need our hospitals, we need our nurses, we need all of these things. And then lastly, the lesson of course, is that we're all in this together. Working together is simply the right thing to do. And it turns out that working together is also the smart thing to do. So um, if you wanna hear more, you can go to our organization, Physicians for a National Health Program at our website, show me Medicare for all here in Missouri. Show me Medicare for all. So that's, that's the talk, basically. Um, I sort of uh, excluded a whole bunch of parts of it because I wanted to make it fit in the, in the demonstration sort of mode. Um, now, if you don't mind, why don't we go straight into sort of the autopsy. This is a, this is a certain an autopsy suite that I think has been affected by COVID because there's no one in it. Um, so it's being very socially distanced. Um, so first thing, uh, I call this talk Healthcare in Crisis, Medicare to the Rescue. So why do, why do I like to call it that? A crisis is a bad thing. A cri nobody likes a crisis, well, very few people like a crisis, and rescuing is good. So I'm trying to set up that we have a crisis and trying to associate Medicare to the rescue as a, as a good thing. And the key arguments I think for us for the next period of time are that employer-based insurance is inherently unstable and that Medicare can actually be cast as the hero of this story. I don't know if you're fans of Rachel Maddow, but I'm a Rachel Maddow junkie, and I've noticed one thing about her that used to drive me crazy, but that I have learned to really appreciate. When she tells a story, has a point she wants to make, she often starts off the story from three different ways. She'll tell the story once, and then she'll completely change her attack in and tell it a second time, and then completely change her attack in and tell it a third time. And that used to drive me crazy because I wanted to hit the fast forward button. But I have a lot of, I have a number of friends who have not been focused on very much on politics until they discovered her. And for the first time, they were able to understand politics. So a lesson I learned from her is that it's good sometimes to make the exact same point in different ways. And that's what we did, right? The first iteration of healthcare needs to be stable uh, was my mother-in-law's story, right? And I hope showing a picture of her activated your, your nurturing frame, as we talked about last time. Um, and then we also talked about uh, this, this story, which is a second way of saying healthcare needs to be stable. And you probably were paying attention, I'll bet you noticed, because I kind of beat it over the head, that it's not your fault. This could happen to anybody. Remember, that was one of the lessons that we talked about. And then UAW, uh, the strike, was sort of a third example of healthcare not being as secure as maybe it once seemed. So this section of the talk <coughs> it was intending to set up the concept that we don't have a stable and secure system. And I, I brought up three points about what's so great about Medicare and uh, I hid in there the use of second person pronouns, yours, you're in control, your money, you live longer. And this is a lesson that I learned from, of all people, Rush Limbaugh. It turns out your choice of pronouns is really important. First person pronouns take ownership, first person singular. You know, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I did this. I don't know how many salespeople I fell for before I recognized pronouns. First person singular is the most powerful. First person plural, not quite as strong. Second person pronouns, you, are very engaging. If you're listening to somebody and they say, well, you know this, you're thinking, yeah, I do know that. You know, maybe not, not, you're not, you know, publicly uh, uninhibited enough to say that, but if you're driving in your car and somebody says, well, you know, and Rush Limbaugh does that a lot, um, it's more engaging. So I try to use second person pronouns uh, in that part. <coughs> I should have gotten a glass of water, sorry. And then in this chart, there's two things I wanted to point out. The first is sort of a covert use of colors. When I'm showing something that is bad, I often try to show it in red because red's a scarier color. When I'm showing something that's good, I try to show it in green. Um, red is bigger and green seems smaller. So most of my charts I try to design like that. But the more important point was that I call this stop wasting our money. So stop wasting. Um, turns out there's this behavioral econ economics principle that I think I talked about, about loss aversion. 
And stop wasting is much more potent than start saving. So save your money, nowhere near as effective as stop wasting your money. And then our money, trying to, trying to bring it together. So I use the stop wasting concept um, three times. Stop wasting our money on bureaucracy. So you saw stop wasting coming up a few times. And then this chart is, I think, a, a really important uh, chart. And it's really important how you handle this chart. So this is an example of showing really dreadful information, right? That we have the worst life expectancies in the, in the modern world. We rank terribly on the left-hand side. And so if you're talking to somebody for whom loyalty is an important, gosh, I got a mark. <coughs> for whom loyalty is a critical core value, that set of data saying that our life expectancies are short, any of that stuff is, um, is, is, is threatening. Um, and the best way to say it, to be the most threatening, is to say years of life are being taken away from us. Again, loss aversion. But you can't stop there. If you show something dreadfully wrong with the United States, you've got to give them a way out. And on this chart, you've got to give them a way to redeem their sense of loyalty. So on this chart, the stuff on the left-hand side is a direct threat to loyalty, and conservatives will start to want to shut down when they hear you talking too much about it. And that's why I quickly followed up with the right-hand side of the chart which I think validates our reason for loyalty. And that's why I made a point to call out that we have to have many of the country's best doctors, hospitals, nurses. Um, it wasn't just a, a, an empty compliment. It was intended to, to put them back at ease with, the, with a sense of loyalty uh, for the, to, towards the country. So it was a fairly, fairly well thought out, fairly, fairly carefully constructed uh, discussion on that portion of it. And then I, I, I try to structure the description of Medicare for All in ways that make the most use of the concepts. So to start off protecting, uh, talking about protecting Medicare is, again, protecting anything activates nurturing, uh, again, hitting a Lakoff frame. All the care we need, we each need, again, trying to hit into tribalism, we each need all this care. So trying to hit tribalism without hitting others. We all need this. We each need this. Um, and then funded like the fire department, um, the fire department, most people kind of like the fire department. There's an awful lot of other public services that are, um, that are more controversial, but the fire department, I don't know anybody that doesn't like the fire department. So it's a pretty easily accepted part of the common good. You know, so why not fund it like we, as we do the fire department? And then on the other question of things, nobody left out includes you and me. Nobody left out, again, tribalism without tapping others. You personally choose. This is an attempt to, to uh, appeal to libertarians. Uh, you, you choose personal liberty. You feel um, it's that portion of it. In Congress, I don't know what concept this is, but I'm here to tell you, whenever I give this talk, when I point out that Congress would be included and that the president would be included under the same plan, half of the crowd claps. Um, it's, it, it really resonates to hear that Congress is included in this. Um, so that's an important point to make. And then here, you're asking, how can we afford this? Uh, notice how I phrased that. You're asking yourself, how can we afford this? It's my attempt to channel Rush Limbaugh. Uh, and you're welcome. I spent six months listening to him for five minutes twice a week to try to pick up on his skill set. That's all I can handle, and I haven't been able to do it again. But, but he does things like this all the time. You're asking yourself. Um, so um, if they can afford it, we can too. This is an attempt to get to prudence and to, and to loyalty. Um, so, um, and then this is an important way to look at it, I think. Um, if you notice, this doesn't have the granularity that we're used to using. First of all, this taps into authority. So I met, met this list of economists. And you choose your audience. Some audiences hate authorities. So, but, in, but in conservative audiences, having authorities is, is usually something that's respected. Um, so use it judiciously. Um, and notice too that I didn't do what I, maybe some of you have seen me do in the past. I used to walk through the detail of something like Elizabeth Warren's tax plan or other, or the Perry Institutes or, you know, the Perry analysis or there's, I used to walk through all of the economics thinking I'm going to prove that this isn't scary, not realizing that just talking about the details, even though I thought the details were reassuring, just talking about the details made them more ominous. So this goes back to the I have a dream rather than I have a plan. This is an attempt to avoid the details. Keep them in your pocket. You know, you need them for answers. You know, have them. But, but 
probably not good to dwell so much on the plan, more on the, more on the vision and the dream. Lengthy plans are easily characterized as just big government. Um, and then the, the lessons, um, I'm not going to walk through them in complete detail, but um, the American people can rely. So again, the American people, this is an attempt to trap loyalty, to tap loyalty and tribalism, and be proud of that word, you know, own that word. Um, and the American people, because people have faces and, and are less, less like others, and can rely on, not, not Medicare is provided to, or, or the American people are entitled to, um, but we can rely, even though those are all true in my mind, but, but rely upon, I think, is a better way to put it. Not users, not takers. The last thing I wanted to call out was this wonky slide with all of this information. The reason I want to call this out for you is because of the, the, the name, the website we came up with, showmemedicareforall.org. Um, I used to tell people, go to pnhpmo.org, which was really easy for me to remember because it was Physicians for a National Health Program, Missouri. Um, but whenever I'd be on the radio and, they, and the interviewer would ask me, so where can they go for more information? And I'd say, oh, go to pnhpmo.org. And, and the, inter the interviewer would say, P-N-H, what was that? You know? um, and I realized, or they aggressively told me that that's a terrible name. So we made up a fake landing page, showmemedicareforall.org. You guys, the one payer states group is, you know, as an organization, is, is, is already ahead of that curve, but I wonder if each of your chapters are. Um, so we made a fake landing page, Show Me Medicare for All. You click anywhere on that page and you go to the more detailed page that we already built. Um, so be thoughtful about what you make as your landing page. Um, at, at a minimum, we have it as a landing page, if not, if not more than that. So let me stop sharing and And we're always in the throes of how to mess the best way to message, you know, healthcare or, you know, single payer versus publicly funded versus just universal healthcare. So, and you, you never really defined single payer. You just said single payer Medicare up there. So I'm just, so my question would be, you know, do you, have you found in your presentations where people still ask you what single payer is and is that, is that kind of uh, a little bit confusing just to throw it up there without really defining it at all? So, you know, that's, there's, that's a really, I think, important uh, question. Uh, on, a, on a broader scale, the, the, what that makes me be thinking about is when I started doing these talks, I would, I would get a question at the end of it. Um, and then the next time I would give the talk, I would make a point to proactively embed the answer to that question in the talk thinking that, well, you know, that, that I don't want, I don't have to be answer, asked that question and there's probably more people wondering. So I wound up with like, you know, a really long presentation that was answering questions that some of the people had, but not, not all the people. And, and what, um, frankly, my wife taught me when she gave me critiques on this was that it's better to have your talk be as Spartan as you can make it, as little in the organized comments as you can have answers to all that stuff in your pocket for a couple of reasons. One, it requires less attention span, but number two, it makes the audience feel ownership and engagement over the discussion. So um, I used to sometimes, I used to spend quite a bit of time defining these terms and I usually don't anymore, especially nowadays that that's above the fold and people are thinking about the topic and if they haven't realized they don't understand what those words mean, we can certainly explain it. If they do realize it, they want to know. So I say that as a, as a secondary question, which term is best to use? Single payer, Medicare for all, universal healthcare, a national improved Medicare for all? I, I don't know. I know there's been survey data that shows that some of those phrases are more resonant than others. Um, socialized medicine actually scores more favorably than I had expected it would. Um, but the, so that's some data shows that's more favorably received than others. Here in Missouri, I am not about to start saying socialized medicine is the, so, so you want to, or actually here in Missouri, I would say. So you want to be thoughtful about your audience and which way you want to define it. And I would say it's probably less important which one you pick than it is that you focus on the content rather than the, the title. You painted a pretty rosy picture of Medicare uh, that made a few of us chuckle. 
Um, my own experience is having lost uh, my physician at the age of about 60. Uh, I went for a number of years, I could not find a physician who would take me uh, because of my age. Mm. Uh, and uh, they don't want to drop you once you've turned 65 and are on Medicare, but they can drop you beforehand. Uh, so uh, there is certainly uh, downsides of, of Medicare. Um, but uh, on the upside um, is... Sure. Well, I'm sorry you had the trouble getting insurance coverage and getting a doctor. That's, that's a, a nightmare when it happens. So I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, I, I think you're right that not every person in every audience has a completely positive view of Medicare. Um, so it's not unusual for me to have physicians complain about it or you have patients complain about it and say, you know, I couldn't get this or that or the other thing. And what I've, what I've found is that I'll bet, I'll bet 90% of the time when somebody tells me what, that they didn't like Medicare, that they don't like Medicare, I'll bet 90% of the time when I hear that, it's somebody who has Medicare advantage and they don't understand the difference between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Um, and for that reason, I used to kind of do a deep dive into what those differences are, um, but I have moved that uh, for non-senior audiences, I've moved that to the back pocket kind of topic. If I have an audience that's like 63 to, to 67 years old, I make a point to focus on it because they've actually got a decision to make there. But for everybody else, I, I don't have that discussion. Um, then there's the people for whom Medicare, you know, is flawed, you know, didn't cover yada yada or whatever. Those are, those are unusual and, uh, and usually can be addressed with the concept of where that's one of the things we need to improve about it. In terms of mental health, um, the two things that I would say about psychiatry are number one, um, the, both of the bills, Medicare for all under both bills, has mental health parity. So that under both bills, um, your ability to get mental health is treated just like your ability to get any other part of healthcare. Right. So um, the people who crafted these bills recognize that there isn't this distinction. And so we, so the bills will greatly elevate the respect the country has, demonstrates uh, to, to mental health services. And that's really important in, in a lot of areas like in, like where I live, where there's the opioid crisis, the opioid epidemics, and, and, and there's no place to get treatment and there's no coverage for that. So having mental health parity is good for psychiatrists and it's good for all of us. And then the second piece is that psychiatrists are notoriously underpaid in all parts of areas. So uh, we know that the way the fee schedules are established today are driven by the most lucratively reimbursed specialists, you know, by the MedPAC process, which is a whole discussion sort of beyond tonight's agenda. But the bills that we're talking about create a, a, a fee schedule, create a process for developing a fee structure that's much more aligned with the needs of public health. And of course, mental health is, is very high on that list. So we should be able to, to address both of the concerns uh, that, that, that that person was raising. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Um, David Young, you had a question? Uh, yeah, uh, regarding the expression universal health care, I'm I tend to downplay the use of that one. And if somebody asks me about it, I, I point out that the insurance companies want universal health care. All you have to do is pay the premiums and we'll all have universal health care. Yeah, I agree, with, I agree with that. And also, you know, last time when we were talking, I brought up the idea that universal sort of triggers racism and, and other things and, 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 and undermines um, 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 tri tribalism. So I, I, t I don't think I ever used the phrase universal health care. Um, but again, it depends who you're asking who you're talking to. I wouldn't, I don't use that phrase very much at all. For, and, and you're exactly right. It's, but none of these phrases are that specific. You know, single payer could also be Blue Cross for the entire country, right? You know. So when you say you don't use um, universal at all, you mean not with any audiences, you just don't use it? I don't it. think I ever use that phrase. I like the phrase nobody left out. That seems okay. to make the same point without triggering anything. Uh -huh. Thank you. And um, William Brunston, you have a question? Beautiful, Ed. That was really great. And how do you deal with neutralizing the uh, folks that talk about a pathway or a roadmap that essentially are corrupted and, and really are happy with the status quo and 
really don't care if we ever get single payer. So I, I, I think the best answer, or my answer to that anyway, um, is that if you look at um, either bill, not, not, so this was different when we had HR 676, right? HR 676 said, pass the bill, nothing changes, and two years later, we go from zero to 100 miles an hour. And that used to scare the pants off of me. And back when we were under 676 as our goal, I said publicly everywhere I went, this is a flaw. I'm terrified by that because no matter how smart, clever, creative we, we are with this, there are going to be unintended consequences that we're gonna screw something up. And going from zero to 100 overnight, that's really risky. So I'm actually quite happy about the fact that, that the, the current bills have a two to four year transition. So when somebody says, we need to do this more gradually, I say to them, well, I, I actually agree with that completely. I agree. Um, but my concern is that you have to legislate that gradual change as a package. You have, if, you, if you just spend five years fighting to get the public option, you know, if we, if, if we focus on the public option, we're gonna spend four or five years fighting to get the public option. And then it'll take two or three years to make it go live. It'll be, and then it'll take two or three years to assess it. It's gonna be 10 years from now before we're ready to take the next step, best case scenario. So if we make the goal, the public option, just because we don't wanna to take too big of a step, that terrifies me. On the other hand, there's nothing wrong in my mind with creating a public option on day one and having it disappear on, on the, at the end of the two or four year process. And that is what both bills do. So if somebody says they want to do an incremental approach, I say more power to you, and I agree, but let's legislate the end as we do, as we legislate the beginning of the increments. So let's not just take a half cup here. But the option of getting Medicare for all includes an expanded Medicare that includes dentistry and all the other, you know, services. So it yeah. really is not quite what, what people that are saying public option mean. They don't really talk about a changed Medicare. They talk about status quo. Yeah. But then that comes down to how much granularity do you want to give to the person who's asking the question? Because that, you know, you want to sort of pace that. Pace the right. thing is there's tons of our friends that don't want this to happen that use our language. Yep. Medicare for all who want it. When the language was first being sort of bantered around, uh, David Himmelstein of PNHP was pretty aggressively against are as a movement going towards the phrase Medicare for all for the reasons you're saying. Um, and he said that's, you know, we don't need to build it on Medicare. We're talking about so fundamentally transforming Medicare that that's, uh, that's, a, that's an, a very inaccurate and, and, and almost uh, um, derailing uh, language. And he was, ver he was very ad aggressive towards saying we should be calling it just single payer. He lost that argument and, uh, and he publicly says, hey, I lost that fight. You know, we're calling it Medicare for all. You know, I can't, and and, and uh, so, you know, I would say that at this point, that's the language that the country has settled on. Um, this fight never ends, right? Mm. This fight never ends. Um, one of my favorite stories is from Carol Paris, the past president of, uh, of PNHP. Um, and she, I don't know if you know this story, she doesn't tell it very often, so you probably don't. She, she's a psychiatrist, and one of her first forays into legislation was that she discovered in her town or area that all the patients from one of the insurance companies were coming to her or a tremendous number. And so she called other psychiatrists in the community and said, hey, are you seeing all these people? And they said, no, we're not, we're not seeing them. And she looked at the company, at the insurance company's directory, and they had like 25 other psychiatrists within a few miles of her, all listed as in network. None of them were seeing any of them. And so she realized that the directory was, was, was nonsense. So Carol went to the state Department of Insurance and got a law passed requiring that those online directories and printed directories yeah. from the insurance companies be accurate, be up to date, and be, be, be correct. You know, she got that law passed and she went home and she went, hooray, victory. What she didn't know, and what, you know, gets to your point, is that that's when the game starts. We, as naive advocates and activists, go home when we get the law. That's not the end of the game. That's the beginning of the game. It's the regulatory process. So she wasn't there at the regulatory committee meetings where they passed the, the language about what the penalty would be for violating the law on an inaccurate directory. And the penalty for an inaccurate directory was set at zero. 
So, so yeah. the point is, is, is exactly, your point is exactly right. That just because we may have mental health parity built into Medicare for all, that is not the end of the game. Funding is critical. All these other things become critical. And that's, that's just the first thing we have to do. But then we, we don't go home. There's a bill in the, in the House uh, sponsored by Pramila Jayapal. It has, I think, like 115 co-sponsors. And yeah. it's called the Medicare for All Act of 2019. And then there's a bill in the Senate sponsored by Bernie Sanders with about a dozen co-sponsors and it's called the Medicare for All Act of 2019. And there are a few really important differences between the two, but the similarities are phenomenal. Matter of fact, most of the language of both bills is like cut and paste. I mean, it's often the same paragraph number, the same exact words, cut and paste. So, so for me, I, I used to go into the detail of the differences, um, but I think that's a little bit wonkier. You know, that's more, that's a next level discussion. Um, and I just talk about it as the two bills. It's important to make the point, and I didn't do it tonight, but it's important to make the point that there are two bills, that there's a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate. Because if you remember from last month when I was talking, and I talked about the quadrants of the brain, um, some people, if they know there's a mechanism, they need to know a process. If they know there's a really, there's a law that could be passed, if they know that, that changes it from a theoretical idea of some, you know, nice, well-meaning people into a real practical, oh, if we passed that bill, we would get this. So it's important to do a little more detail than I did tonight on the fact that there are two bills in the House. You know, in, in Congress. Uh, it's something I learned from Claudia Fagan, the national coordinator of PNHP. She'll sometimes go to a meeting and she'll say, um, okay, we all know there's problems with, with health insurance. So um, raise your hand if you have health insurance. And most crowds, people will all raise their hand. It's just, okay, we know it's screwed up, but keep your hand up if you think it's pretty good. And most people keep their hands up, they say more or less. And so, okay, keep your hand up if it covers physical therapy. And they mostly keep it. So keep your hand up if it covers physical therapy after a stroke. Uh, and some hands go down. Okay, they don't know. Keep your hand up if it covers 20 visits or more, if it, and, and most of the hands. Keep your hand up if it covers physical, if more than 20 visits for PT in your house, or if you have to go to the hot and all the hands go down. And she says, that's the point. You just told me you think you have good health insurance, and you have no idea what your insurance covers or how well it works. I mean, I've got a lot. I'm in a very conservative district, and there's a lot of people that are like that, including my current representative, representative in, the, in the state state house. And how do you talk specifically to people like that that have no, don't, do not feel any shared feeling towards <laughs> people who aren't contributing monetarily to like they would be? So I'd say a few things. The first is, you know, don't be as stupid as I was. When I started giving these talks, I used to open my talk with, we all agree that healthcare is a human right, right? So let's move on and figure out how to, that's like, no, we don't all agree that healthcare is a human right. And what I quickly discovered was that if I opened up that can of worms, that would consume at least 10, if not 15 minutes of the circumscribed time window that I have. It's not like you have an open-ended three weeks discussion if you have time for it. You've got a start time and a stop time and you get to decide somewhat how you allocate that time. And so for crying out loud, if we open the topic of healthcare as a human right, you can expect to spend 10, 15 minutes in a really interesting discussion about ethics and morality. And it's really interesting, but I would submit it's adjacent and not core to the question at hand. We don't have to answer the question of whether or not healthcare is a human right. If your goal is to reach into the liberal base and you wanna bring them out, then the phrase healthcare is a human right is tapping core liberal values of nurturing and caring and it resonates and, and raising the banner, healthcare as a human right, might help get liberals out to vote, might help get liberals to, to support you, um, might swing some of the independence towards you. But oh my gosh, you know, the, the, it's much more likely to just drive conservatives insane. You know, and, I, and, and they'll say things like, where's that in the Bible? I don't, where's that in the Constitution? A life, liberty, and the pursuit. Well, that's not really the same. You know, it's... It's, well, the World Health Organization says it's a human right. Well, who the hell's the World Health Organization? They're not in Missouri. You know, I mean, it's, you're, you're creating a whole cascade of things that you don't want. So the first part of my answer to you is don't start that discussion. You have, it, have answers available if somebody else starts the discussion. Focus on the, on the core that you want to talk about. But if it comes up, 
then when I start, if somebody asks me, so do you think healthcare is a human right? Okay, here I lie, because I do. But I, but I don't, I would, I'd never answer that outside of friends. And what I would say, which is also true, is I don't know. I'm not an ethicist. I can't tell you what's a human right and what isn't. Actually, I can, but I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is that it's to my advantage to have you have health care. It's the same thing as if my neighbor can choose not to have the sewers drain his house or have the garbage picked up from his house. If he doesn't have the sewers drained from his house, well, guess what? Our neighbor is going to start to smell and my property value is going to go down. So does he have a human right to have sewer, collapse, sewer drainage? I don't know. But I can tell you, it's, a, it's what we call a common good. It's to all of our advantage that we all have this thing. If I want to go to a restaurant and I don't know, and, and I don't know if the person in front of them, if, if they have two lines at the restaurant, one says your servers at this line have health insurance and your servers in this line don't, so you can pay a little bit less for your meal because your servers here don't have health insurance. I'm going to go to the line where they have health insurance. You know, it's a common good. Um, is, is how I would answer. And then the other piece with a conservative who says, I don't want to put my money on it when they're not putting their money on it is, so are you saying that if somebody comes to the ER with a heart attack and they don't have insurance and they don't have a gold card in their pocket and they don't have a bundle of cash that I should not treat them and I should let them die? Now there's one or 2% of Americans that would say, well, yeah, yeah. Um, 98% of Americans, I don't have stats, I'm making that up, but the overwhelming majority would say, no, 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 treat them and we'll figure it out. Okay, if you want me to treat them for $50,000, I'd rather treat them for $10 a month to give them his blood pressure meds. If we're going to pick up the most expensive part because we can't stand the idea of letting them die, I want to prevent that. It's just a waste of money to do it the way you're approaching. And I'm too, you know, maybe you're okay with wasting money like that. I am not. I am prudent. So if you're not prudent, okay. That's kind of how I, I'm maybe a little more aggressively than I usually would do it. 